Well, I guess uh, Francis isn't here, which is unfortunate, but I'm probably the best second person to replace him because my work is a direct extension of what he's doing. Uh, so it makes some sense. So I'll be talking about uh, high order finite element schemes for multi-component flow problems. And this is, uh, all my numerical examples are implemented in FireDrake, so I think it's good to be presenting here. This is a uh, joint work with Patrick Farrell and I'm a PhD student in math uh, at University of Oxford. Um, so to motivate uh, what I'm looking at, uh, these are multi-component flows. And so here we have this picture, uh, some pollution or smog in the air over London. And so the question is, how could we model this uh, pollution that's in the atmosphere? Uh, well, the idea is that the smog is comprised of multiple chemical species or pollutants, and they're all interacting with each other in complicated ways. They all have their own concentration fields and velocity fields that are varying in space and time. And so it wouldn't really suffice to just model the average velocity of the air or the average, uh, say, density of the air. You would also have to really want to take into account the velocity of each pollutant separately and model how those different velocity and concentration fields are all interacting with each other. Uh, so this situation would be an example of what we call a multi-component flow because there's multiple chemical species we want to model their concentration and velocity fields individually. Uh, so to give some further examples of where this can occur would be uh, in biology. Biology, say you have transport of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs. Uh, in nylon manufacturing, it turns out that mixtures of benzene and cyclohexane turn, to be very, turn out to be very relevant. Uh, what we're very interested in uh, is lithium ion battery modeling. There you have lithium salt dissolved in organic solvents, and those would be your different chemical species. Uh, so the trouble is, is that almost all of the numerical methods that are in the literature uh, on multi-component flows rely on some limiting assumptions. They might assume that the fluids are ideal. That means they satisfy some analog of the ideal gas law from thermodynamics. Uh, they might assume that the coupling between the diffusive physics and the bulk convective behavior of the fluid can be decoupled, whereas in reality you might want those different physics to be coupled somehow. Uh, they might also assume that diffusion can be modeled using Fick's law, which is, as I'll show, not always a great assumption. So our aim is to devise numerical schemes that don't rely on any of these assumptions, and what we're particularly interested in is using this for lithium-ion battery modeling. Uh, so to set up the notation, let's say I have n different chemical species labeled by this index i. Then the first set of uh, equations that I'm looking at here, which are used to model diffusion, are these onsager stefan maxwell equations. And what they do is they express the diffusional driving force uh, di that acts on species i in two ways. So on the left, what we have here are these kind of thermodynamic forcing terms. So these are really gradients of thermodynamic quantities. Well, what are all of these? So ci is the molar concentration of species i. Mu i is the chemical potential of species i. Omega i is the mass fraction of species i, and it's the ratio of the density of species i to the total density of the fluid. And p is the pressure. So this can really be thought of as thermodynamic forcing terms because it's gradients of thermodynamic quantities. On the right, what we have, well, let me just introduce the notation. So M is this Onsager transport matrix. Uh, its entries are a known function of the concentrations that I don't give. And VI is the velocity of species I. And so really what this thing on the right here is telling you is that the diffusional driving force that acts on species I is essentially proportional to these relative velocity type terms. So, you know, if one fluid is moving mostly upward and the other one's moving mostly downward, that's going to result in some sort of diffusional driving force between the two species, which I think is kind of intuitive. Um, so to get a better intuition of where these equations come from, we can consider what's called the dilute regime. So let's uh, suppose that the concentration of species K dominates all others, so CI is much less than CK. So in this regime, and if you assume the fluids are ideal, you can show that the OSM equation is reduced to the usual Fick's law, which says that the molar flux of species I, Ji, is given by these two terms here, this self-diffusion term, so something proportional to the gradient of Ci. That's what you always you know, see in Fick's law. And then you also have this invective term. But note that the invection is only done through the velocity of species K. It's only occurring through Vk. So notice that Fick's law is really only coupling species I to species K. There's no coupling between species I and species J for any uh, uh, J not equal to K. So this is kind of the trouble. The OSM equations are essentially generalizing Fick's law, and we're allowing for all of the species to be coupled through to one another simultaneously. So the idea is that we'd want to use the OSM equations where we're outside of this dilute regime, which could occur, for example, in lithium-ion batteries. Uh, so that's how we model the diffus diffusive physics. 
to model the convective physics, what we do is we introduce this so-called mass average velocity v. So v is defined to be this weighted sum of the vj's. Recall that this omega j is the mass fraction of species j, and vj is the velocity of species j. So this is really just the mass average velocity, as the name implies. And we call this equation here the mass average constraint because in our numerics, we actually enforce this constraint in a sort of weak sense. Um, so how do we actually model V? Well, there's you know, different choices that we could take. For now, what we think the simplest thing to do is just use the familiar Stokes equations. So what we do is, our, well, what we really do is we assume that V satisfies the Cauchy momentum equation. So here's the usual Cauchy momentum equation. We drop the nonlinear term because in the context of lithium ion batteries, we don't think that the uh, non, we think that the nonlinear term is not too important. It should be a low Reynolds number regime. Uh, and so tau here is the viscous stress tensor that usually occurs in Newtonian fluids. Uh, we can use a non-Newtonian non constitutive law as well, but for now, to be simple, we're gonna stick to a Newtonian constitutive law. Um, so we put this all together, and what we get are these Stokes on Sager Stefan Maxwell equations, and these were introduced as well by Francis in the last Fire Drake meeting. So here's the OSM equations, here's the Cauchy momentum equation, here's a, a steady form of the continuity equation that I didn't introduce previously, but it is nothing more than a steady form of the continuity equation. And this is the mass average constraint. But notice, actually, I'm only enforcing the divergence of the mass average constraint. And this is following ideas from Francis Asneran. And to compensate for this fact, we uh, actually will add some augmentation terms to equations 1a and 1b. That would have been discussed last fire Drake meeting by Francis Asneran. It's not novel to this work, so I don't discuss it further. But these are the equations. So now let me describe what makes things actually difficult. Well, first of all, everything in these equations is an unknown field, except for f and ri. So there's a whole bunch of unknowns. Uh, you also look at it, and you see that they're very nonlinear. Already looking at this, you can see it's clearly, there's lots of quadratic nonlinearities, unknowns being multiplied by one another. Uh, but also, if you write down the formula for mij, it turns out to be a rational function of the concentrations. So actually, we have rational nonlinearities in here. But actually, it's even worse than that, because for the ideal gas law, the concentration of species I has to be proportional to the chemical potential of species I. It's even more complicated for non-ideal fluids, so we have rational and exponential nonlinearities going on here. Uh, to my mind, yeah? What's, what's V without uh, subscripts? That's the mass average velocity. Uh, uh, it just doesn't seem to feature in any of the other equations. This V? Oh, yeah. well, so, so tau is uh, related to the symmetric gradient oh, of V okay. using the Newtonian okay. constituent law. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, there's no literature on well-posedness of these equations. Uh, there's almost new literature on numerics for these equations, except for a recent preprint paper on archive by Francis Asnerin. And there's many unknowns, so numerics is going to be very expensive. So that's, those are the challenges. These are the equations. Uh, so what do we do? Well, as a first step, as we always like to do in applied math, we can begin by studying a linearization of the problem. So here we look at the equations, and let's just pretend that the fields, the CI, the concentrations, the omega I, the, the mass fractions, and the MIJ, the transport matrix entries, pretend that we just know what those are, then actually you see that these SOSM equations here are a linear PDE uh, in these three plus two on unknown fields. The bulk velocity V, the pressure P, the stress tau, the species velocities, and the species chemical potentials. So if we make this Picard linearization, we get uh, at least a nice linearized problem. Um, in fact, as is typical for discretizations of the Stokes problem, it is possible to eliminate the stress tau, and in this work we will also be doing this, so actually the stress tau is not treated as an unknown. We eliminate it in standard ways. Um, now, in practice what we want to do is solve the fully nonlinear problem. So how do we do that? Well, we'll apply Picard iteration. So we start off with some initial guess for the concentrations, Using that initial guess, we solve the Picard linearized SOSM problem. That gives us a guess for the velocity, pressure, species velocities, chemical potentials. Using that guess, we compute an updated guess for the concentrations, and then we just iterate this procedure until we hopefully meet some convergence criterion, although that's never guaranteed to happen, of course, but you know, hopefully sometimes it will, and sometimes we do indeed observe that it does converge. Um, so that's the, we've taken the PDE, we've linearized it, now we want to come up with a weak formulation for the PDE so we can actually use finite elements. Uh, so the next step is to identify what weak formulation we want to use. So here we look at the equations and you ask yourself, well, what should I do for the weak formulation? Well, first of all, 
uh, we know that V and P are essentially the solutions of the Stokes problem. So it's reasonable to seek those fields in the usual function spaces for Stokes, velocity in H01, pressure in L02. <clears throat> the question is, what about to do with these species velocities and chemical potentials? Because looking at this uh, PDE, to me at least, it's not clear at all what to use. Uh, so one of the main novelties of this work uh, is the following, where we actually figure out what function spaces to use. Um, so if we rewrite the continuity equation uh, as the following, as it did v tilde i is equal to mi ri, where v tilde i is defined to be the mass flux of species i, it's uh, mi ci times vi, mi is the molar mass of species i, that's just some known constant. So we see that this is essentially saying that vi tilde has a divergence in some sense. So what should we do? Well, instead of solving for the species velocity vi, let's instead solve for the mass flux vi tilde, and let's search for it in h div. Um, so that's great, that's what we do. But then the other question is what to do for the chemical potentials. So if you take the left-hand side of the OSM equations, multiply them by an h div test function, which we can kind of do now because we're using h div as one of our function spaces. Formally, we get this integration by parts here, and this stuff on the right well, that's actually well-defined as long as the chemical potential and the pressure are in L2. So what are we gonna do? Well, we'll search for the chemical potential in L2 as well. So that's kind of what this, what this realization gives us. And, and using that, we're able to prove the following ice theorem. So if we assume that the concentrations and density are bounded away from zero and Lipschitz continuous, uh, then the Picard linearized problem has a unique weak solution in these Hilbert spaces. So the bulk velocity and mass fluxes live in this Hilbert space V. The pressure and the chemical potentials live in this Hilbert space Q. And actually, you can show even that the problem is well posed within homogeneous Dirichlet VCs. It's interesting to look at the proof of this, or just the sketch of that. Um, so essentially, what we need to prove when you write down the weak, when you write down the weak formulation, you want to prove the problem is well posed, what you end up with is a familiar saddle point system from finite element methods. So you have this infinite dimensional operator A and B and its transpose up here. And we know how to show that. Uh, infinite dimensional mixed operators of this form are, are uh, bijections. So to show that, well, we do two things. We can show that B is a surjection. That's not too hard to do. We can also show that A is symmetric on V and it's coercive on the kernel of B. So standard results about mixed problems on Hilbert spaces that yield that the problem is well posed. Uh, but what's interesting about this is because A is symmetric, uh, if we discretize this problem with conforming finite element methods, we get a symmetric linear system. So that could be nice for the linear algebra. Um, now, okay, that's all the PDE stuff. Now going on to finite elements, uh, what finite element spaces should we use? So recall that the exact solution to the problem lies in these Hilbert spaces here. Well, let's say we use the following discrete finite element spaces. So VHB for the mass average velocity space, VHS for the mass flux spaces, PH for the discrete pressure spaces, and UH for the discrete chemical potential spaces. Uh, as you can see, we're only considering for now conforming finite element methods. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to choose these function spaces so that we get a well-posed discrete problem and that it's quasi-optimal in the V times Q norm. So essentially what we're trying to do is discretize some saddle point system. So we know we can't just choose any old function spaces. We need to have satisfy some sort of stability condition or an if sub condition uh, in order to guarantee that our discretization is well-posed and quasi-optimal. Uh, so the following theorem tells us how we can do this. And remember that all these theorems are applying to the Picard linearized version of the problem. So let's uh, suppose that the mass average velocity VHB space and the pressure space PH and the mass flux space VHS and the chemical potential space UHS are insubstable in the following sense. So for the bulk velocity and pressure space, we require the standard insub condition for Stokes. Uh, for the mass flux and chemical potential space, this M subcondition is the same as above, but instead of an H1 norm, we have an H div norm. So this is actually what you would typically see in discretizations of the Poisson problem in mixed formulation. If we have these two M subconditions, and we also have the divergence of the mass flux space is contained in the chemical potential space, this is also something you typically see in discretizations of the mixed Poisson problem, then you're able to show that the linearized discrete problem is well posed and the scheme is quasi-optimal. Um, so what are examples of spaces that actually satisfy these conditions? Uh, well, there's actually a whole bunch of them in it, so it's very nice. So we could use Taylor Hood or Scott Vergalius for the bulk velocity and pressure space. That works for high order, that works in 2D and 3D. And for the chemical potential and mass flux spaces, we could use BDM or Ravier-Tama 
And again, that's all nice to do high order in 3D as well. And of course, that's all been implemented in Firebreak. So it's a, it's a good situation. Um, and so now let me just give a proof of concept of this. So this has been, uh, of course, implemented in Firedrake. So what we're doing is polynomial degree P4 for, uh, and P3, uh, sorry, so P4 for the bulk velocity and the mass fluxes, and P3 for the pressure and chemical potentials. I think in practice we're using Taylor Hood here and Bretzi Douglas Marini there. Uh, and we solved the fully nonlinear problem using Picard iteration. This is on a manufactured solution test. Uh, so it really is just at this stage a proof of concept, but we see that we are getting the optimal rates of convergence as we would expect from the theory. Everything in the uh, V times Q norm is converging as H to the power of four, which is consistent with quasi-optimality. Uh, in fact, the velocity in the L2 norm is converging as H to the five. That's probably due to some elliptic regularity, uh, but I haven't looked into that too much. So I need to you know, clarify here, this is really on the unit square here. Well, I, I did say that this is only a proof of concept. It's up here. Uh, this is on the unit square. The exact solution is known and very nicely behaved, but at least it shows that uh, you know, thing, things are working at least initially in this, in this setting. Now, obviously more work needs to be done, but at least we have these, these nice initial results. Um, so yeah, so for future work, uh, we want to upgrade from Picard iteration and try and use something like Newton's method or continuation with continuation. Uh, eventually, we'll want to use this scheme to validate or predict the outcome of physical experiments, for example, in batteries. Uh, everything I've presented here is for the time-independent case, so we might want to extend the time-dependent case. Uh, those that are more interested in theory might be interested in, say, studying the nonlinear problem more rigorously at the discrete and continuous level, because all the theorems that I stated here are for the Picard linearized version of the problem. We're kind of just crossing our fingers that the nonlinear Picard iteration will actually give us useful results. Uh, another example would be to develop a structure preserving scheme that enforces the mass average constraint exactly because right now it's only enforced weekly. Um, so that's everything. Uh, my only reference is this paper on Archite by Francis Hasnaran and co authors. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, so in the Picard iteration scheme, the way it works is the concentration is the exponential of the chemical potential. So basically what I do is I compute the concentration as a projection of the exponential of the chemical potential. Now, I guess technically the projection of a positive function is not guaranteed to be positive, but in practice I do observe that that happens. Um, so so it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be a huge issue yet, right now. Yeah? How would you solve that in your seven point problems? Right now I'm just using uh, an LU solver, so mumps. Yeah? Does the derivation of fixed law as a limited case of the Omsega transport matrices assume a certain form for the MIJ? Because I feel like it would next on would need to be converging over state entity. It does. Um, there is a known there's a known formula that's unambiguous for the MIJ that applies in all cases. I didn't state it here, but Essentially, it expresses Mij as a rational function of all the concentrations. So there is some formula that you use in that derivation. Good. Thank you very Thank much. You.